All right, we're going to look at chapter four, key issue three. Why is access to folk and pop culture unequal? Just off the surface, let's think. Folk culture, it's isolated and small. Popular culture is made for the masses. There, that's it. Key issue over. Okay, I guess we better dive in. Well, the situation is you got massive electronic diffusion of pop culture. It gets around the world very, very quickly. Popular culture diffuses rapidly around the world through electronic media. The obstacle to keep people from getting pop culture is just a lack of access. Perhaps they don't have television or they don't have internet, internet access. And that's not even very common anymore. Most of the world has television and internet. And I've been in some pretty remote areas. And you're surprised who pulls out a cell phone with internet access on it and they can get on uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter right there in the middle of the jungle. It's just insane these days. So if uh, there's a new popular style or brand of shoe, it's going to get around the world really quickly, even to remote areas these days. So one of the things is the obstacle is lack of access. Like you, you can't get um, what's popular culture. But the other thing is money. So even if you're in the remote jungles, maybe they can't afford the new style of uh, clothing. But it, it comes through these days pretty quickly. The things that spread pop culture, one of the biggest, is the biggest, is TV. Because it's the most popular leisure activity. People work, people go to school, but when they come home, they chill out in front of the TV. Okay? Here's the deal. The average human watches 3.1 hours of TV every day. I mean, I didn't really think about that. You sit in front of the TV for three hours. Here's what's shocking. The average American watches 4.6 hours of TV per day. Wow, I did not realize that. That's almost five hours of sitting in front of the TV every single day. So here's Mr. Patterson's personal challenge. We've got to reduce that. Sure, it's fun to go home and relax. That's one of the greatest blessings. Um, and it's good to get some news and things like that and uh, just relax by watching your favorite show. But that's too much, really. That's way too much. If we want to make positive change in this world, we've got to get away from the television set as Americans, okay? So let's make that commitment together. I can tell you just for me, this is just my personal input here. I don't even have television. I don't have cable. I don't have any of that stuff. I have TVs in my house. And I will watch movies that I rent or get off of like Amazon or YouTube or whatever. But I don't sit in front of the TV for 4.6 hours per day. Life is too awesome. There's too many things to do. I challenge you to do the same. In any case, TV. This is diffusing pop culture. In the early 20th century, which is when? That's in the 1900s, right? 20th century, so that's 1900s. So in the early 1900s, TV develops in multiple countries. United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, Soviet Union, and the United States. So these developed countries, they all have television that kind of develops at the same time. Then in the mid-20th century, the United States dominates with 80% of all TV, 86% of all TVs. So the United States gets up and running. They have a whole bunch of TVs. The U.S. population is being inundated with television and everything that goes along with it. So we're, we're in the lead. In the late 20th century, you know, 1970s to 1999, TV is diffusing into Europe big time. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. So TV diffuses to Europe. Pop culture is expanding there. And then in the early 21st century, which would be the 2000s, what we're seeing is near universal access across the globe. Everybody's got TV. So these days, we look at how Americans spend their weekends. And again, this is kind of sad. Like it's cool that we have the blessing to be able to chill out and watch TV and relax, but half of our time is spent just sitting there watching TV. I mean, how, how much other things can we be doing and, and exploring and creating instead of just sitting there? Like maybe we cut that in half and change it to 25%. But in any case, here's what we do. Reading 5%. Wow. That's not good. I mean, maybe we get lots of information these days on TV through like YouTube where we're getting... Maybe we watch some historical YouTube, but whatever. Thinking and just relaxing, small amount there. Computer games, okay. Traveling and leisure, 10%. That seems pretty good. Hanging out, socializing, that's always good. But watching TV, how much time do we spend? That is so much as Americans. If we want to get back to the status where we're able to influence and change the world in positive ways, each of us sitting there individually watching TV for all that time, we've got to change that on our own. Diffusion of the Internet. 
So we had television that diffused pop culture. We also got the internet. Internet diffuses like television, but at a much faster rate. Consider that in 1995, only 40 million internet, internet users were worldwide. We had 25% of those. So we had over half here in the U.S. and 40 million worldwide. In 1995, I had just found out about internet. I think in 1992, I believe, I didn't even know what internet was. I had no idea. We had, cell, we had phones that plugged into the walls of our house by a wire, and that was it. We didn't have cell phones, no internet. And I graduated from high school in 1994. So in 1992, I remember my dad took me to his office for the first time, and he's like, let's look at colleges that you might want to go to. And I'm like, okay. He turns on his computer, and it went something like this. No joke. It was a weird, weird sound that dial up internet because it had to dial into the phone to access the internet. And he pulled up this site, and it was a search site that doesn't exist anymore, but we searched for the first time about colleges. That was weird, and I remember that. And before that, we had to use, like, paper, like an encyclopedia, like a book where you'd look up colleges, where you'd go to the library to look up a physical book, or you had to go visit the college. That was the first time I even knew what Internet, internet was, and that was 1992. I know you don't care, but in any case, it's fun for old people like me. In the year 2000, it goes from 40 million all the way up to 361 million. And that's only in five years. Exponential growth there. So if the internet goes all the way across the world now, think how fast pop culture diffuses. French fries, McDonald's is advertising on the internet. Are you going to want to have some of your folk, traditional, wonderful, delicious, unique food? Or are you going to want to have McDonald's? Well, maybe it depends on if you have the money. And if you've been watching television, that's diffused from the West here. Social media, not just the internet, but social media. This spreads information and trends and pop culture so fast, like instantaneously ac across the globe. These, the thing about these things are, is it, it begins in the United States and then it spreads rapidly. So the U.S. the U.S. continues to dominate the content creation. So even though the globe has access to media content. The United States still dominates. We still create most of the content, meaning our culture is spreading across the globe more than anybody else. You see here in 2008, who's got Facebook? And 2011, at the time of the printing of this textbook by Rubenstein, look how many people are using Facebook now. Now, I know you kids these days, you're, you don't even use Facebook that much anymore. You're using like Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram. And probably by the time you're reading this post, you don't even use that anymore. But this is just an analogy of Facebook, how it blew up in just three years. Um, and then over here, we've got Twitter. So where are we using Twitter? Still, the United States is big, but it's going across the globe as well. And even into all of these countries. And then YouTube. The United States still leads, but it's diffused across the entire globe. So content, popular culture is being created in the United States, but it's going across the globe. Threats to folk culture. Well, how can we keep these unique traditions and culture and aspects of civilization that are different from what we find in the United States? Well, the problem is a lot of the media is controlled by developed countries like Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States. These are the big three. What people are watching on TV in general all across the world, it's coming from Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States because they have the resources to create incredible uh, capturing programs. If you're from the United States and you're a broadcast company, you're already set up. You've got media and flashy graphics and information, and you've got the financial resources. If you're from, I don't know, um, Peru, and you want to create your own TV station so your people can watch that, but you probably don't have that much money. So if you're a Peruvian citizen, what are you going to watch? Are you going to watch something from the United States, which has a lot of money and flashy graphics and uh, people that are dressed in nice clothes? Or are you going to watch something from your local station that they're just kind of learning how to do and they don't have very much money and it kind of looks amateur and doesn't sound that great? I mean, it's only natural. What are you going to watch? So this becomes the problem because if you want to maintain your folk culture in Peru, it becomes really difficult, especially with internet and television that diffuse pop culture into people's lives, because they tend to not want to do their folk culture anymore, because what they see on television says, it's really cool and flashy and fun and popular to do pop culture. So what idea comes into people's mind is that, are we watching entertainment, 
or is it cultural imperialism? You know what imperialism is. It's when, like the British, they went into other countries and they took over and they brought their way of life. So if we turn on the TV in Peru or in South Africa and we're watching Western content, media created from the United States or maybe even the United Kingdom, are we being entertained by watching their shows or is it really a way of us being imperialized or having products such as Coca-Cola, Nike, McDonald's come into our country and take over. See, we think that there's this uh, way that countries are standing out, but now more and more they're turning to pop culture because of television and internet. Um, the problem is Western culture in television seems to glorify independence violence with TV shows, sensuality, and consumerism buying things. Well, folk culture doesn't necessarily follow any of these. It, it, folk culture tends to follow family, tends to, um, uh, this goes, goes back and forth because people do fight, but other cultures do uh, have nonviolent uh, traditions. Um, you know, let's face it, in the United States, our, our television shows a lot of sensuality, and traditionally, folk cultures, they are very minimalized, and they are um, they keep things discreet or hidden. And then consumerism, that has become a value of pop culture, like buying things and creating jobs is important. Whereas in folk culture, more and more, um, we look into their traditions, and it's really about just um, their traditions and family. So when we talk about cultural imperialism, people from countries with a lot of folk culture, they sometimes worry that it's not just television and entertainment, it's a way of manipulating their culture. The other thought is the news. Is it fair news or is it biased? If you're getting news that's from major countries like Japan, U.S., or United Kingdom, well, then we're really only seeing news that reflects Western values. We really only are covering Western concerns. So developing countries, they just can't compete with the funding of major networks. So the news they end up seeing really is based from like the United States. So if you're watching that, then over time your culture is adapting to the culture of the United States, the popular culture. So to cope with some of these threats, countries have attempted to do different things. One of the things they've tried to do is limit or block television. And you think about Soviet countries um, in the former, former, former Soviet Republic or China's done it, North Korea does it, where they just block the television so their people can't uh, be influenced by pop culture. They, of course, have tried to restrict internet use and maybe even restrict you going to certain sites. And they've tried to ban social media as a way of maintaining their control over folk culture or control in general. So, I mean, I see both sides. Like, Western culture is certainly an overwhelming influence. And I see the uniqueness of folk culture. So I can see the struggle with these things right here. And here's where we see countries that try to limit access to these four types of internet content. So here's the countries that are trying to block political content. Here's the countries that are trying to block social content. And you think about um, in pop culture, we see gender and gender equality much more than we would here in the South A Southwest Asian countries, where they try to maintain social inequality for in a lot of aspects here, conflict and security. Well, China doesn't want people uh, seeing programs that deal with conflict and security. And internet tools, they're blocking creation tools in these countries in Southwest Asia because they want people to, to only follow what is known in these areas. So you see that on the one hand, television, internet, it's very powerful. But at the same time, it also has the power to influence traditional folk customs.